Garrett, uh, I read that uh, only 4% of the universe is uh, stuff like you and me and this bench and this uh, beautiful ocean. Uh, all the rest is either dark matter, supposedly 20, 25%, and dark energies, 70%. Uh, how can you be so sure of that? The only thing I see is, uh, is the stuff around here. Uh, this is one of the things that actually got me into cosmology in the first place, is this notion that you know, we're the icing on the cake and there's a lot more cake underneath <laughs> us. And uh, how do we know? Well, astronomers are really good at their jobs. So one of the things that we do is, of course, is uh, measure the universe and we take a census of matter in the universe. And there's a whole different range of techniques in which you can measure objects. And one of my favorites is this gravitational lensing, whereby you can use the deflection of light as it travels to the universe to weigh how much matter there is in an object. And what you find is if you take a typical galaxy, you can add up all the starlight and work out how much mass there is in stars, but there's always 10 or 50, depending on the size of the galaxy, 100 times more dark matter than there is in terms of the, the, the okay. atoms that we see. So let's run through that because it's important to understand how that works because you're just, you're making a statement that I know is true, but I want to understand how it works. So how does uh, gravitational lensing allow you to determine the amount of, of total mass, dark, dark, and a dark matter plus ordinary matter? How can lensing help you determine that? So uh, one of the nice things about gravitational lensing is it, it doesn't care about the mass that is causing the deflection. Right. So if you've got a, a, a lump of mass, be it you know stars or pumpkins or dark right. matter, a light ray, when it passes, it will be deflected by a certain because amount. Because of Einstein's general relativity. Einstein's general relativity, exactly. The, the space curves, and so the light beam is going straight in its own its own uh, frame, but because the space curves, the light is going to look like it curved. Absolutely. And what this does is it actually distorts our distant uh, view right. of the distant universe. So if we can see those distortions and work out the, the, the details of those extor um, uh, distortions, we can invert the, the lens in. And that basically reveals the amount of mass. That's right. So there. what you're weighing by the gravitational lensing is is the entity that's doing the lensing, not not the the far source. Yeah. The far source is like a light source. Absolutely. And you're seeing how much that 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 proximal galaxy or totality is in mass. Absolutely. Okay. Now we got that. Yeah. And, and that's just one method to measure the mass. So I said, when we look at a, an individual galaxy, we could measure the amount of mass that's there that's doing the lens in, and it's always more than the amount of mass that's there in the stars and the gas, which we can easily see. Right, another way is because the rotation, the speed of stars are maybe is related to the gravitation, the amount of gravitation there. It's going too fast, then you know there's something else driving it. Yes. So for our sun, right? Our sun travels around the center of our Milky Way galaxy, right. 220 kilometers per second. Okay. It would leave the galaxy if, it, if the gravitational pull was only the other stars. Uh -huh. So there has to be another mass component in the galaxy. Right, right. And it's not just the rotational speed. You can also look at the motions of galaxies amongst themselves, uh -huh. the bulk flow of galaxies, uh -huh. all uh -huh. of these kind of things. They always tell us that there is more mass that we can see. Okay. So we know there is this component of dark matter out there. And then said at the end of the 1990s, we had this discovery of dark energy through looking at very distant sources in the universe and charting their journey from uh, very far in space to now. That actually reveals what the expansion of the universe did between the time the light was emitted and it was received. And then how do you go from that to it, it, it's a, a equivalent of 70% of the mass energy of the whole universe? How do you, how do, you do that quantitative analysis? So um, we, we, can, we can do synth we can make synthetic universes in some sense, right? We can write down the mathematical equations for what would a light ray do in a universe if it had this much matter uh -huh. and this much other stuff. And we look at the sources that we see and we basically play these quantities off against each other and find out what's the best mix of stuff to explain how bright these distant okay. sources look, okay. okay? And what that reveals is that it said roughly 30% of the universe is matter, roughly 70% is this dark energy stuff, the stuff that's causing the acceleration to, um, um, the expansion to accelerate. So we have a strange mix in the universe, a universe dominated by the dark sector with dark matter controlling local gravity, but dark energy controlling overall expansion. Your own work, uh, how, how is it contributing to this understanding? So what I'm trying to work on at the moment is I'm trying to sit between particle physics and cosmology. So astronomers like to think of dark matter and dark energy as these two straightforward entities. They, they are just here in the universe. Dark matter provides a, a, a scaffolding to form galaxies on. Dark energy 
accelerates the universe. If you talk to particle physicists, though, they'd say, well, the dark sector is unlikely to be that simple, that there is going to be physics going on mm -hmm. in the dark sector. And maybe there's not just one simple dark matter particle, maybe there's a family of them. Maybe they have interactions. Mm -hmm. Maybe they are the equivalent of dark photons. Maybe they interact with dark energy. Now, the, the question is that, yes, these are great ideas, but how do we test them? And what we want to do is take these ideas and put them into our synthetic universes, our simulated mm -hmm. chunks of the universe, evolve the universe with these interactions turned on, and compare it to the universe that we see, and see if that gives us a better description of what we see out there on the sky. So it, it's kind of tricky because what we're really talking about is adding uh, physics on the very, very small microscopic scale into simulations of stuff going on on a large scale. But this is what we were doing already by adding stars and other gas, etc., to simulations.